No go. I got it. We got one. You got one? Yep. She's out. You can keep it. I can keep it. All right. Yeah. Uh, All right. So zero day. Zero day. And uh, colon crash sure. cyberspace. Thank you. That's the reason I'm here. Well, no. Uh, no, I get it. No, the reason they asked me to come is because we were working last year. Uh, so. Okay. E booked. All right. Very good. And I have that right, two time Pulitzer Prize finalist. Right, and I have a If I can have everyone uh, take their seat, we're going to launch uh, right into the next session, just as soon as we can. Pretty much all set? Okay, uh, good afternoon. Uh, again, if we could take our seats, we'd like to get this... Uh, started just uh, as soon as we can. My name is Ralph Bolter. I'm with the, uh, the Target Corporation. Uh, I hope everyone is enjoying their new notebooks which are left in your uh, places uh, during the break. Uh, it's, really, uh, it's really my pleasure and frankly my honor to, uh, to kick off this next panel discussion on private industry's uh, role in the cybersecurity realm. When I left uh, government uh, about a year ago, the FBI, uh, to join Target as, a, as their director of corporate security, uh, it was widely acknowledged uh, at that time that the cyber threat was the top emerging uh, threat to our national security, and that it may, in the short to moderate term, uh, actually eclipse uh, the terrorism threat uh, that obviously have been long-standing in, in being in, as uh, the number one uh, national priority. So not much has changed in the last year. Uh, as we've heard from uh, public and private security uh, officials uh, over the last couple of days, uh, the cyber threat is still commonly cited as the threat that uh, most keeps uh, many of those professionals uh, awake at night. So what concerns people about the threat is not only, in my view, the dynamic and ever-evolving nature of the cyber risk in all of its dimensions uh, and the damage that a cyber attack could potentially inflict on uh, our critical IT infrastructure, uh, but also the impact uh, that it could have on our economy, uh, ultimately, and everything, all of the consequences, the adverse consequences that go with that. So, uh, and the other great concern, uh, in my view, both uh, during my uh, public service and now in the private sector, uh, and I think it's the, the view of many others, is, uh, is that we don't currently have uh, an established and developed way forward, a consolidated way forward, uh, to adequately counter the threat that exists. But this is one thing we do know, and that is that the pathway forward will most likely require an alignment of effort uh, on the part of the public sector and private industry uh, of a nature that we have not recently seen uh, in our history uh, to be effective at countering this threat. Uh, and the private sector's involvement uh, will be broad in this case because, as you all know, uh, the IT infrastructure is largely uh, owned by private entities. 
And so naturally, uh, some of the responsibility for security of that infrastructure has to, has to pass uh, to the private sector. For our part, uh, Target is deeply uh, committed to public-private partnerships. Uh, I won't go through the litany of partnerships that we are involved in, uh, but they, uh, we are deeply committed to them, uh, and we uh, really promote uh, betterment of the communities that we do business in uh, through those partnerships. But the one thing I would draw upon uh, from those partnerships uh, that I have seen, and again, on my, in my public uh, career and now at Target, is the spirit of cooperation that exists uh, in those partnerships uh, that I have had involvement with. And that is key, I believe, in my editorial comment, uh, but it's key in my belief uh, to a successful strategy, counter uh, cyber threat strategy going forward. So with that, I want to uh, kick this to the panel, and I want to in introduce our moderator, two-time Pulitzer Prize finalist, and Washington Post reporter Robert O'Hara, Jr., who incidentally uh, just published an ebook uh, called Zero Day, uh, the Threat in Cyberspace. Zero Day, the Threat in Cyberspace. So with that, Mr. O'Hara. Thanks. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, this is a fascinating subject, and uh, uh, an hour doesn't come close to doing it justice, but our goal is to uh, make a believer of at least a few more of you. And uh, uh, before we get going with the panel, I'd, I'd like to offer uh, uh, a few thoughts that I, I think are fascinating. Uh, as some of you know, that uh, the digital universe uh, came alive recently. Uh, it came, came to life on October 29, 1969, when researchers at US, UCLA sent a single message to the Stanford Research Institute, and that message was, log in. Uh, only two letters made it through and yet a uh, communications revolution began. In the following years, as networks spread and computer power exploded, hundreds of millions of people found their way online. And then an idea that began as pure science fiction became a reality, uh, cyberspace. Now cyberspace, I would contend, is the most complex man-made environment on Earth. It expands every moment, an uncounted variety of devices in addition to computers have been linked into cyberspace, offering all of us magical features and services. Smartphones, industrial control computers, satellites, our jet fighters, elevators, GPS systems, all the phones you have in your pockets, uh, the list grows by the, the minute. A researcher at Cisco estimates that some 50 billion devices will be connected to the internet in the coming decade. In the early days, researchers thought there might be 10,000 computers in all linked in. And as a consequence, from the beginning, at the beginning, security was not a high priority. As a result, hacking has always been a problem. But as I think a lot of you recognize, something changed last year. Uh, the world became aware. Uh, it seems as though everyone, the president, lawmakers, corporate executives, and re regular people, began acknowledging the threats in cyberspace were unprecedented, unrelenting, and possibly existential. Attacks on computers and networks occur every minute of every day now. And yet it is often difficult, sometimes impossible, to know who exactly is behind a hack, or where it originates, or even if it's occurred. Almost everyone with access to a computer and the internet can be a cyber attacker. Motives for attack can be as obscure as their origins, the best that defenders can often do is react quickly and well. Resilience became the mantra in 2012. Many of you have probably heard that Leon Panetta used the phrase cyber Pearl Harbor. I think uh, the warning has been used in the past. It carries a new weight now. What can be done about all of this? Our panel is going to explore industry's role in cybersecurity, as you heard. A role that grows more challenging and complex every day like cyberspace itself. There's a good reason to focus on industry. Most networks are owned by and run by industry. Most of the trade secrets reside in private databases. Most of the attacks focus on companies. Speaking of these issues is a group of security specialists with me here who combine decades of firsthand experience contending with cybersecurity in both the government and the private sector. They include, in no particular order, I'll let them uh, raise their hands, Michael Cheridoff, who's the chairman and co-founder of the Cheridoff Group, 
a security firm and business consultant with a growing uh, global portfolio. Uh, he's former Secretary of Homeland Security. Scott Charney, Corporate Vice President of Trustworthy Computing at Microsoft, is a former prosecutor who served as the Chief of the Justice Department's Computer Crime and Intellectual Property Section. Kevin Mandia is founder and executive of Mandiant, a cybersecurity firm that helps organizations detect, respond to, and con contain computer intrusions. Suzanne Spaulding has joined us. Uh, she's the Deputy Undersecretary for the National Protection and Programs Directorate at the Department of Homeland Security. And Amos Malka, he's the Chairman of the Board and CEO of Logic Industries, AGT's dedicated security solutions provider. Formerly, he served as the head of Israeli defense intelligence. It's quite a panel, uh, and we're going to uh, let the conversation go where it will. But I'd like to start with uh, Mike Cheridoff to ask, uh, Mike, is it realistic to expect the private sector to defend, defend national security when uh, so many of the uh, government and private sector um, d data uh, flows together on the networks? <clears throat> well, first of all, you're quite right. I mean, the networks, uh, everything travels over the same pipes, or largely the same pipes. But here's what's different about cyber threats as opposed to physical threats. Uh, the battlefield, so to speak, in cyber is on everybody's private network more than it is on government networks. So there are only two ways to deal with defending that. One is you could invite the government to sit on everybody's networks. And given the news over the last couple of weeks, I doubt that that would be a solution. Most Americans would say, yeah, let's do that. And I don't think the government is wild about doing that. And the second is to help the private sector help itself, uh, which means getting them up to speed in terms of threats, information sharing, <clears throat> capabilities, um, architecture, solutions, and resilience. Government can play a role there because they're unique uh, insights government has, there's intelligence government has, and there are capabilities government has, but the private sector has them too. And this has got to be a, a real instance of true collaboration. But I want to follow up on that. Uh, the collaboration uh, almost always occur, uh, occurs in an atmosphere of, of trust. Uh, the private sector often doesn't trust uh, the government enough to share information in part because it becomes instantly classified or the government has different uh, fish to fry or something. What about that level of trust? How important is that and, and how do we get there? Well, I think you're quite right, Robert. It is important. Uh, you can't have a relationship without trust, <clears throat> but the way you build trust is by having a relationship. Now, there are some legal things that could be changed that would make it easier. <clears throat> you could create safe harbors that allow exchange of information between the government and the private sector to take place without fear of lawsuits. The government could declassify more of what it gets, or alternatively could uh, allow a greater number of people in critical industries to have clearances that would allow them to see that information. <clears throat> um, and I think these are not uh, dr dramatic or extraordinary steps, but would help build that ongoing set of relationships, which is the foundation of trust. Scott, uh, Microsoft's been involved in some <coughs> partnerships and uh, is deep into cyber. Um, can you tell us a little bit about if there is any fledgling public-private partnerships that have been successful and what's impeding um, further successes? Well, I think there have been more successful public-private partnerships over time. And I think the reason for that is both the government and the private sector have become more crisp about what it means to partner. Um, in the early years, and when I was on the government side, we went to industry and said, we want a partnership. And they said, well, what did you want us to do? We said, we need a partnership. And they said, OK, we're in. What should we do? And we said, we should partner. <laughs> um, and this went on for a decade. Um, but over time, what has become clear is that the partnership actually has to be very structured in a couple of ways. First of all, you know, companies respond to market forces. And if you think that attacks against cyber systems is a national security and public safety issue, market forces don't do national security. You can't build a market case for the Cold War. That doesn't mean you won't get security from the private sector. What you will get is security that the markets support and a little more because companies want to do the right thing and protect their customers. So where the public-private partnership have shifted to in a good way is thinking about, OK, how much security will the market give you, how much security do we need for public safety and national security, and how does government 
fill the gap between what the market will provide and what society needs. I, uh, it occurs to me that one of the challenges in these partnerships is the um, atmosphere of secrecy that blankets a lot of activity in Washington. Uh, and in my experience, uh, companies uh, get very frustrated with that because they will give, but they don't get. How big a problem is the, uh, is the culture of secrecy surrounding cyber? And is that, should that be unchanged or should there be some evolution in the thinking? There's no question it needs to change, and I think the government is focused on how it can declassify more things and share more. My own experience on the private sector side, though, is that we've had a pretty good information sharing relationship with the government. And I want to add one important point, not just the U.S. government. Um, this is a super important point that especially when you're in a room full of policymakers, often when you're in the United States, the bulk of them are U.S. people. They don't really focus on the global implications of this. So I was working with the American Bar Association Task Force, and they wanted to do the scenario planning, where they said, okay, let's assume that an attack is coming from a foreign nation, and they use the favorite nation of choice these days, but let's assume an attack's coming from this nation on a banking system. What are we going to do? What should we do? And should we shoot back? And I said, what do you mean, we? Whoever you shoot at is my customer. And when they get shot, they will ask me for help. And I will go help them. So you know, one of the things about being a global company is that it's very hard to apply sovereign rules in a sovereign agnostic internet. And getting policymakers to understand that this is a global environment in which they have sovereign interests is really a bigger challenge than the information sharing piece. Amos, tell us a little bit technically and then more broadly, why does it uh, uh, matter that in the US we are so domestic centric uh, when it comes to talking about cyber. Why should we be looking at things more globally? I understand the concerns uh, of the United States, so uh, the focus is uh, local, but uh, on the other hand, the cyber uh, warfare is by nature is international and global uh, warfare. And uh, uh, regardless any geography, any location, any borders, no borders for cyber security, the attackers can uh, be located uh, in a different corner around the world and to attack New York or uh, Tel Aviv or uh, uh, London. Because of the nature of uh, how the internet is built and how it works? It's, it, it's the software warfare. It's not, uh, you don't need missiles, you don't need to cross borders, you need the software smart uh, uh, people. And uh, if you look around the, the world, individuals and corporates are facing the same challenges around the world. Regardless of the location, if you go to the terror and strategic uh, targets, some of the targets are international targets, like uh, could be international targets, like international banking, international uh, air traffic, uh, energy, water systems, etc. And the experience, the accumulated experience is international because you have some allies, some other nations that are facing the same challenge. So information sharing, some of the development, startups around the world are thinking about new, uh, new solutions. But and even the industry, the cyber industry is international. It, it sounds uh, dire to me because uh, it seems like our diplomacy on cyber is just beginning. Uh, can these problems be solved, Amos, without uh, you know, layers of diplomacy among companies? And excuse me, companies and countries. I think that uh, between countries there is a uh, relationship uh, without the, the diplomacy. I think that the agencies, the relevant agencies are talking with the relevant agencies uh, across the ocean. And uh, I know personally we have a, a very intimate uh, relationship with other services. Uh, this is the basic. And then I think that the partnership between governments and industries uh, uh, Still to be defined, what are the borders, what are the firewalls, what are, are the closed rooms? But I think that the partnership between industry, international coordination uh, between states can, can, uh, can be some good uh, benefits. Su Suzanne, uh, what do you think about the international approach? Um, and should our government be focused more domestically or does there need to be this broader look? There absolutely needs to be a, a broader look. And, and, and not only in the ways we've talked about and the kinds of forums that we're active in these days, whether it's the 
uh, ITU or, or uh, the cybercrime you know, convention groups or the OECD and the various international groups where we come together with the five eyes or the group of eight. Uh, and we do this quite a bit to talk about our common challenges and to share best practices and to understand the ways in which uh, we are all interconnected and, and we can't look at these attacks in isolation. But also, in terms of our, our, our uh, understanding of the full risk spectrum. So cybersecurity is first and foremost a risk management challenge. And, and so we know that means that you, you, you break it down, you think about uh, risk, assess your risk as a function of threat and, and vulnerability and consequences. Uh, and then you look at the ways in which you can mitigate and buy down that, that threat, and that gives you an overall risk management plan and perspective. And we have to, we cannot look at that uh, in isolation. You can't look at it at, as just a cyber threat. You have to look across physical and cyber to understand that. These are inextricably intertwined. Uh, and you can't look at it as, as a, within a single state, entity, or country. And so we, for example, the Department of Homeland Security have done these regional resilience assessment programs where, and they've been cross-border. We're, we're engaged in one now with Canada, uh, where we look at, across all hazards, the threats, and it also allows you to look across all of that spectrum for solutions. So, Kevin, we've just heard a, a remarkably rational, logical approach. We now have not just a domestic approach. We have people who are thinking globally. Amos articulated that very well. Mm -hmm. And obviously that's been going on for at least a few years. And yet the attacks are, uh, it seems like it's a free for all. The attacks are becoming more innovative. They're evolving. Uh, the threats mm -hmm. feel very dire. Um, it seems like it could be a while for all of this to come to fruition. What about the short run? Should companies mm -hmm. just take matters into their own hands and uh, hack back somehow, or you know, or what should companies be doing? Uh, that's what you folks specialize in. I think one good start would be think twice before you hack back. I don't think that's going to have the results you think it would. And I'll give, there's probably seven good reasons why I wouldn't, but I'll give you two here today. First, right now in, the, in just the United States alone, there's probably a thousand companies that are actively compromised by a targeted threat. And that targeted threat has operated with a rule of engagement where they haven't crashed your systems, they haven't shut your business down, but they have stolen your IP. So the, the availability of your data is still there, and, and really the integrity of your data is still there, but the confidentiality has been broken. If you hack back, if you're just one company, and you hack back and you start changing that rule of engagement, the consequences will impact the other 999 companies that are sitting ducks. So right now, and, and other people say it a lot simpler, don't throw rocks when you're in a glass house. What would happen here if we change those rules of engagement is we're already sort of pinned and we're flicking the person who's pinned us in the nose saying stop pinning us, but we're losing the fight right now. So they're already in. And if we do non-orchestrated hackbacks uh, because it makes you feel good in the short term, it'll have long-term uh, probable ill effects. So what are your clients doing to, uh, to cope? Well, and actually yeah. tell me this. Yeah. How long, what's the time frame for a more coherent, effective deterrence framework, whether it's a uh, corporate or government? And in that, in the meantime, what are your clients doing? Well, I think there's tons of ways to have deterrence, and they're not just technical. There's non-technical. There's ways of looking at trade. There's ways of looking at other theaters of operations to do deterrence. But it is a lonely world when you're compromised. When you hear me speak, I really represent over 400 companies that have been uh, intruded upon that have lost their IP or they've lost the availability of their data and they've had virtually nowhere to go to when this happens and it's a lonely world as a victim that has changed I've been doing this for 15 years and in general now there's less of a negative stigma if your company's been compromised you can do a little bit of outreach and normally what happens when you do that outreach is someone says well welcome to the club it finally happened to you or you finally noticed uh, but there was a long period of time, if you were hacked and you knew it and you told somebody, you were condemned for it. Uh, that has to change or else we're never going to be able to work together to solve the problem. Uh, but we're at the, we're not, as bad as everything's been hyped <coughs> about cyber, security actually has been getting better throughout my career. It's just that the attackers, uh, you know, everything's, we depend on cyberspace more. And I think we have more visibility and more awareness. So we're just more aware of these challenges now. Okay. Uh, Let's see, uh, uh, there's a lot of talk about legislation. There's going to be legislation coming up. I know they're working on the Hill. Um, 
they're going to try to set the bar low because um, uh, we're at such an early stage in cyber. Um, uh, Scott, why don't you tell us your thoughts about how important information sharing legislation might be? I know that's an important goal for the Pentagon, and uh, we've heard from the NSA, and that's important for them. Um, and what, uh, what would it take for corporations to participate, particularly in a climate in which relatively innocuous information becomes classified when it's handed over to the government? Well, I, I think the biggest thing for information sharing is having a good description of what's being shared with whom for what purpose. You know, in the early days, we talked about sharing everything for situational awareness. But actually, companies and organizations don't want to share everything. And there are a lot of reasons for that, whether it's protecting the privacy of their customers, protecting their business proprietary information and the like. And it also wasn't clear when you gave this information to the other party, how were they going to protect it? How are they going to use it? Would it leak out? And those issues in the early years weren't addressed. And I think more recently, people have become much more sensitive to this issue. And the key for us has always been sharing information with someone who can action it in a meaningful way to protect the ecosystem. And I can give you a real example. Um, you know, we have this thing called Patch Tuesday. The second Tuesday of every month, Microsoft issues its patches. And following Patch Tuesday became Exploit Wednesday. And that happened because the bad guys reverse engineer the patch. They see what's changed. They now know how to exploit it. And therefore, they could launch their you know, malware the next day. And for customers, this was a real problem because when they get the patch on Tuesday, they can't deploy it right away. They have to test it in their environment and make sure it's not going to break their applications. So we thought about, OK, how can we use information sharing to solve this problem? And what we decided to do is we created a program called the Microsoft Active Protection Program, where the week before we issue the patch, we give information regarding the vulnerability in the patch to antivirus vendors and intrusion detection vendors. Why? It's a limited set of information given to a trusted set of people who can action it. And what do they do? They create their signatures and deploy their signatures in their antivirus and IDS systems. Why does that matter? Tuesday the patch goes out, Wednesday the malware comes out, and it's stopped by the antivirus product or the intrusion detection product. So, you know, having that kind of targeted focus sharing is mm -hmm. what we need to focus on. And the legislation is really about, particularly for some companies, heavily regulated companies like the telcos, they have um, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act and other things that potentially create liability for them if they shared this kind of information. So some companies want to make sure that if they co uh, cooperate with the government and share information that can be used in the right ways, they're not just subject to tons of lawsuits. What do you think, Mike, uh, about information sharing? How important and should it be legislated? <clears throat> well, let me explain why it's important. Um, you know, basically, if everybody lives in their isolated target zone, and that's what, kind of what Kevin pointed out, then the bad guys have an opportunity to use the same technique or tool over and over again against fresh victims. Um, if you are able to collaborate and identify threats before they proliferate, you're able to shut down those threats. That's what Scott talked about. And that doesn't eliminate the threat, but it forces the adversary to go back into his or her toolkit and find new tools. And that means you're pushing them in terms of their resources. So it's critical to have that information sharing. But as Scott points out, uh, you've got to give people a safe space to do it. Part of it is it has to be efficient and targeted. And people have to understand the purpose for which it's being shared. Second, you have to have a trusted group of people who are receiving it. And that can't be everybody in the world. And I think the Microsoft idea of having people who can actually turn it into actionable defense is a, a one very smart way of doing it. What the legislation needs to do, however, is get us out of the um, high risk liability issue, where if you share information about a, a malicious signature or IP address, the concern is you get sued or we wind up with a, a corporate version of what we've seen in the NSA program in the last month. And all of a sudden, no good deed goes unpunished. Instead of getting lauded for sharing, you're being brought into court and you're being sued for sharing. So you've got to create rules of the road, um, privacy protection, but also a safe space <clears throat> in order to enable the sharing to go forward. A couple thoughts to follow up. You said privacy protection. Uh, one of the things that seems lacking uh, are consequences for misuse of data that are meaningful, whether it's in the corporate world or in the government. People don't lose their jobs. They don't get punished. It seems to me that data 
is so fundamentally important to our economy, to our military, national security, that uh, it seems to me that that's going to be a key component. Are we going to see any uh, legislation that um, imposes serious penalties on people that misuse data, or am I misreading the situation? You know, I'm not sure you're going to see that, partly because the issue of how data is used is, is not a very well thought through or uh, debated policy issue in our government. Um, you know, again, I'm, I'm being a little bit ironic, but I'm looking at the uh, huge spin-up that occurred in the last month over the government collecting but not even looking at your telephone billing records. This is the stuff that AT&T and Verizon has uh, that shows the to and from number. It's nothing that's crown jewels. And yet we've had a huge uproar over that. There are commercial enterprises that are data-based enterprises. And what they do is they collect enormous amounts of data about what you do when you search online or things of that sort. And uh, that can be used and marketed in all kinds of different ways. And you don't get much of a, of a spin up about that. So we need to look at the whole issue of data protection and data rules in a co comprehensive way before you can get into the issue of how do you legislate about it. So you seem to be alluding to the fact that the Privacy Act, which is one of the, you know, the framework right. for a lot of this, was done in 1973 before cyberspace was really born. Do we need to have, uh, and anybody can jump on this one, do we need a new Privacy Act after a serious debate? And uh, later on, I'd like to hear from the audience about this one. Are our laws up to date with our, uh, with our use of data and the data, what I call the data revolution? I'll take a quick answer and turn it over to others. My answer to that is no. At the time that we did the original legislation, the government was by far the big, most powerful, and potent collector of information in society. Now the government, to be honest, has a real run for its money with uh, certain companies in the private sector. And, that's, and the disparity is not only a question of logic, but it's a question of whether bad guys, you know, if someone collects a huge amount of data uh, because you're, you know, they know what you're searching and they know what you, what's in your email, and they don't protect it, then that itself becomes a, a rich target. So it's a broader conversation. Scott? Yeah, I, I can add to that. We have been having a global dialogue on what we call fair information principles. It's not just about the Privacy Act. The OECD has fair information principles going back to 1980. And really, there's a bunch of principles, notice, choice, accountability, security, and the like. But over time, what most people fixated on was the concept of notice and choice. That is, if I give you notice about how your data is being collected and how it's going to be used, you could opt in or opt out and make a choice. But we have entered the world of big data. There is a ton of data created. Some of it's user created and taken from users. Others machines created, like GPS data. We are awash in data. And the notion of notice and choice does, just doesn't work. I mean, Carnegie Mellon did a study that said if the average person just read the privacy notices, you know, for the websites that they visited in the course of a year, they'd spend 76 days reading privacy notices. I, I'd, li I'd like to note, if anybody in here has written those notices, don't raise your hand. <laughs> right, and so that model's just not working. And ultimately, it's not going to be about collection because data is collected by all sorts of parties all the time. It's really going to be about use and letting people so, control that use. So getting back to my question, do we need a, a new legal framework with consequences for the misuse of the data. Yes, and one of the things we've been promoting because we think it's super important is if you go back and look historically, particularly in Europe, which has been much more active in privacy than the US has been, it is really focused on regulators and protecting consumers. And what's been missing in that equation is actually the role of the entity that has the data. And we think there has to be an accountability model. So if you're a, any entity, government or private, that is using data, you have to have an accountability model. And what that means is that you have privacy training, you have privacy people in your organization, you have privacy policy standards and procedures that are followed, you audit that to make sure it's done, you make sure people are held accountable. And the reason to have that kind of program too is that when governments want to come in and see how you're handling data, it's not an ad hoc process anymore, they can just look at your program all up in your accountability. Suzanne, uh, is government going to be willing to spend more money on the people and the training in order to enforce this new framework when it comes around so that people feel the data is being used properly and they trust DHS to have access to these mountains of information? So, I, you know, I think DHS has uh, uh, 
has worked very hard on establishing these trust relationships both with the private sector and with ordinary uh, citizens. So we have, following the fair information uh, practice principles, uh, put out a privacy uh, impact assessment for all of our cybersecurity programs, which is a, a, a bit unusual. Uh, unclassified privacy impact assessments that tell the American public what this program is about, what kinds of records we're collecting, and, and, and for what purposes, uh, among other things. And, and so that's a really important part of And we have had to, yes, uh, beef up our privacy staff uh, in order to be able to sort through those issues and, and be able to put out those privacy uh, impact assessments. We also have developed trust, again, it comes over the years of experience with the private sector in terms of protecting their information. Congress helped us in 2004 giving us statutory authority, protected critical infor in infrastructure information statute, which says if you voluntarily provide uh, the Department of Homeland Security with information about your vulnerabilities, say, uh, on your system so that we can help you mitigate those vulnerabilities, uh, that information is protected. It cannot be used for regulatory purposes, the information that we have. Uh, we don't hand it over to regulators. It is exempt from FOIA. It cannot be used in civil litigation. Uh, and, and we have had that in place since 2004. We've had these partnerships. We've had lots of information come in from the private sector, and it's never been disclosed. Am Amos, tell us, uh, give us an outside perspective on the United States uh, yin-yang love-hate relationship with privacy and this obsession uh, that comes and goes. Are we thinking about it the right way and how do you do things in Israel? I think that uh, the United States is facing the, the main challenge and uh, I'm the last one to, uh, to judge the, the priorities of uh, the United States. Uh, I think that uh, from hearing all the discussions here that uh, you are talking a, a lot about privacy and about information uh, uh, management of uh, the people, uh, a challenge that will be much more important when we go from big data to Internet of Things, that uh, sensors and, uh, and information and data will be connected uh, all together in a few years. And uh, I think that in my country, we keep the right of uh, people, but the security outcome is uh, very important and uh, sometimes you have to make the priority. I think that the priority the United States uh, makes is, uh, is the right one. I'd like to shift gears here a little bit and, and get a little more granular. Can you tell us one or two of the attack vectors that are being used now by the bad guys? Email. Absolutely. First, the answer is yes. I can tell you one or two. Uh, the, the attacks that I've seen over the last uh, seven or so years have really focused on coordinated, targeted email or Skype or instant messaging. <laughs> and the goal is to get somebody on the inside of an enterprise to either click on a link or open up a Word document. If we go through the last 415 attacks that we've responded to, the attack vector has been a PDF document that's dropped something on your machine, a Word document, Excel document, PowerPoint document, or you click on a link and download malware okay. yourself. All right, so now mm -hmm. uh, uh, Robert O'Hara has clicked on that PDF. Sure. Uh, tell me the next step. You said it drops something on the computer. It what, does. What is that? It's something that uh, a lot of folks call command and control. It's the ability to upload files to that victim machine so you'll have an unwitting recipient. They got an email, they clicked on a link, or they got an email, they opened up a PDF, in your example, without any bells and whistles, because most people's line of defense is antivirus. So antivirus is probably not going to do it for you. Uh, it's going to miss the type of attacks that we see and we respond so, to when you're targeted. All right, so I want to take you through sure. this. So I've clicked on it, right. code, computer code, software mm -hmm. was dropped onto my machine and it's not complex, right? What does it do? Does it then communicate back out to someplace? What the first thing that happens when, and I might as well step back, you got an email, it purports to be from someone you know, mm -hmm. it has an attachment <coughs> that's interesting to you. You click on the attachment, you start reading the attachment, unbeknownst to you, your machine has just done a call to someone on the internet to download a, a malicious file. That malicious file will execute, and then there are bad guys out there that can now look at everything on your hard drive, access it, copy it, delete it, do whatever Couldn't, you So we could just follow that one message and find the bad guys, right? I wish it was that easy. It okay. is not that easy. Every single attack that I generally respond to, the attacks look like they're coming from the United States, and, we, and that's not true. 
The attacks are coming from school systems, academia, other victim companies, and you have to go hop to hop to hop. And then over time, you finally get to the, the hop that says, oh, this attack's coming from Taiwan or from China or from Eastern Europe. So you usually have to track it back. On the flip side, if somebody hacked your machine and you have real crown jewels on it, sometimes what we see is your email's so important it's going straight back to China or straight back to Russia because there's something critical in it. So we get, we get shortcuts. We get so money. this is a social engineering. They're playing on people's psychology. Uh, <coughs> Michael, what kinds of, what's another type of a hack uh, that's effective that you've seen? Well, first, let me, you know, let me come back to the Internet of Things because I think that was an important sure. point that was, might have flown by people. It's a kind of a new jargon word. But you know, most of what we've read about in the paper involves the theft of data, intellectual property. You've probably heard about the attack on Saudi Aramco or the natural gas company in Qatar, which involved a lot of destruction. You've heard of denial of service attacks. But that's still based on the notion that you are ultimately the target is either a repository of data or it is an industrial control system. We're now moving to an era in which even your, your appliances are connected up uh, wirelessly or hardwired into the internet and controlled remotely. And as that happens, the ability to affect those by hacking into a network starts to become a brand new problem. They did an experiment a couple of years ago at a university where they remotely controlled automobiles using the OnStar connection between the automobile and the, and the headquarters back there. Now let your mind imagine where that might go with other appliances. One example I heard, and it's going to be a more, a more significant problem as we get to the uh, smart grid, is of a particular enterprise, which I won't name, which discovered it had a um, malicious um, advanced persistent threat in its network for some time. How did it get in? They had well protected their, kind of their obvious locations, but there was a remote connection to a thermostat in another building that was unprotected. And through that, the bad guys entered and got into the network. So uh, the complexity of this is going to increase, and the strategy of dealing with it is no longer, as Kevin will tell you, uh, you know, the marginal line around the perimeter. It is about defense in depth involving almost continuous awareness of what's going on. Mike, give us a, a, a brief overview on what you mean by defense in depth. So, um, you know, most people conceptualize you're going to get your firewall, you're going to kind of circle the wagons, maybe cut the number of connections to the internet, and, and then you patrol the perimeter. And that has some value, but it doesn't catch an awful lot of things, as, as Kevin pointed out and as Scott pointed out. So what are other things you do? First of all, there are, is the identity and access controls. Who gets to see what? Who gets to go where on your network? That's the issue that arose with this fellow Edward Snowden. There's continuous monitoring to look at what is moving where in the network, what is moving out of the network, what is anomalous about that. There's the use of encryption as a way of protecting data even when it's at rest within your data system so that if someone acquires it, they can't necessarily use it. Mike, I, I hate to interrupt you, but yeah. all this sounds just right, but boy, it's inconvenient and it's very costly and it's going to take a while. Is that something we have to live with, or should we just ignore it and hope it doesn't occur to us? I, I sure wouldn't ignore it. I, mean, I don't want to dominate this, and I, I think I'm going to let others no, talk okay. about it. No, it's okay. Just follow um, up on this one. I, I think, look, the reality is, it, and it's what everybody has said on every panel this last two days, it's risk management, not risk elimination. You're not going to eliminate intrusions. You're going to have them. Uh, what you have to do is identify, you have to look at your enterprise. What is the most important? What are the threats? How do I prioritize the threats? What can I absolutely not afford to have penetrated? And what you know, can I live with? And then you have to stack that against the cost of taking certain measures, and you, and you manage the risk. And that's what we do all over. Let's go back to the prior question, Scott. What's a really interesting attack vector that you folks have seen that is nasty and effective? Well, look, there are four primary attack vectors. And this has you know, been true for a long time. There are supply chain attacks which are you know, generally used by governments. There's vulnerabilities so in code. Say, no, that's a fascinating thing, but uh, some people might not know what that is. Give us an so example. So what happens, of course, is in, in when you have an IT system, it's made up of computers and uh, routers and all sorts of machines and devices. And the question becomes, um, who supplied that device to you? And has it been tainted when it first came into your hands? 
You mean so, some code or backdoor? Right. Or something? So I, I, if I if I am a reseller of computers, even a small one, I might say people bring in their machine to have it fixed, and I fix their machine and I put a keystroke logger on it and I give it back to them and they pay me for it, and then when they go home and they type their username and password, it's transmitted to me and I have it. But why don't we check? before that gets into the marketplace, whether that stuff is on the chip or in the software. So more and more of that is happening now. There's a program in place now to move a lot of security to what we call a hardware root of trust. Because software is very malleable and can be changed. And there's a thing called a TPM, a trusted platform module, which is in many, many machines today, most of the machines you buy. And it has a cryptographic key, has a mathematical formula built into it at time of manufacture from which we can load things on top of it and constantly check the validity of it. Mm -hmm. So people do worry about these issues. It is about risk management. Um, but there's supply chain. There are vulnerabilities in systems. There's uh, misconfiguration or mismanagement of the system. And there's social engineering. Let me, let me jump on one since it's you, and then we'll go on to Suzanne and ask her the same question. Uh, we know that there's a lot more code uh, software on a given machine and that for X number of lines, there are zero day attacks. The, maybe you could give a quick explanation about what a zero day attack and whether you think software makers are really absorbing the full cost of doing business in making sure their software is protected, hardened, and checked for those zero days. So a zero day attack is an attack on software that the vendor is not aware of. So in the normal course of events, when a researcher is looking at a product and sees a vulnerability, often they will report it to the vendor and the vendor will issue a patch to fix it. Sometimes you see an exploit in the wild, like Kevin will be doing an investigation, and he'll say, wow, there's a vulnerability in this product that is being exploited, and he'll contact the vendor who says, I didn't even know that vulnerability existed. No one reported it. So it's already being exploited but the vendor had no knowledge. So you had zero days to fix the problem. Now, if, was the vendor, generally speaking, doing enough to protect against those vulnerabilities? Are they testing their own software or is that? I guess what I'm getting at is I, I wonder if that might be one of the solutions over the next decade is somehow requiring uh, or is coming up with a system where vendors who don't take care in the writing of their software are punished by the market and the, the government or both? So about 10 years ago, Microsoft started down this path of adopting what's called the secure development life cycle um, because we had too many vulnerabilities in our code. And one of the decisions we made early on as we were building more secure code was that we weren't going to hoard it for competitive advantage. We would share it. And we published tools and documentation about how, the, how others could do it. Cisco has a Cisco Secure Development Lifecycle, for which in their blog they gave us credit for our help. Adobe has now a Security Development Lifecycle. And we just got the SDL process essentially standardized as ISO standard 27034. And so one of the things we have to do as an industry is improve the quality of software through better development practices and tooling. But you have to come back to it's risk management, not risk elimination. Anyone who thinks that we can create something like a Windows, an Office, Adobe, uh, iTunes, name it. If you think that humans can create this complex code with zero errors, you're just wrong. And that's why we go to defense in depth. Because one of the things that we've done, and others have done it too, is knowing that there'll be vulnerabilities in code, the question comes, how can you protect the customer even though there's a vulnerability on the machine. And we have built-in technologies so that even when a bad guy tries to exploit the vulnerability that we didn't know about, it still fails. Suzanne, tell us uh, a little bit about, to keep it grounded, uh, what's the threat, uh, the actual threat that we should be most afraid of now? And what would you recommend in a, a broad sense that government, industry, regular people do about it? So the most pervasive threat today is the theft of intellectual property. Um, and, I, and I do, I want to make the point that, you know, we, we are still, I think, uh, largely in our infancy in the way we talk about cybersecurity. We have so much still to, to learn about this and certainly a maturity in the way we think about it. Uh, because we do talk about cybersecurity and it reminds me of the days when I used to worry about weapons of mass destruction, uh, working for the CIA. Uh, and we talked about that, weapons of mass destruction, as if that was one thing. 
And it wasn't until we broke it down to biological, chemical, nuclear, radiological that we began to get some traction and develop effect, uh, more effective policies and, and approaches. Uh, cybersecurity, similarly, is not one thing. Uh, it, you know, theft of intellectual property is a challenge that is not the same as the threat to industrial control systems, uh, which is not the same as the theft of, of, uh, of identity, identity theft, for example. And, and the actors are, are we come, uh, different actors come at this from different directions, and we have to get more granular in our discussion well, about it. Give, give me three examples of what you mean by intellectual property, <laughs> just concrete examples, so people understand why uh, the threat is so important. So, you know, a, a pharmaceutical company that spends uh, thousands or millions of dollars in developing a, a, a formula for a breakthrough. Uh, medication and and before they can get it to market, uh, it's showing up uh, elsewhere uh, because their systems were penetrated, the secrets were stolen. Got it. Uh, that's a lot of money down the drain. Now, uh, uh, in, the interesting thing I think about intellectual property theft, and, I, and one of the reasons I think we have to break this down uh, into its component pieces, is because it helps inform the comparative advantage between government and business that helps define that partnership. So, so what do we, you know, what do each of us bring to that risk management equation? And it varies depending on what we're talking about. On intellectual property, businesses are really in the best position to make that risk management calculus, to do that cost-benefit analysis, how much their intellectual property is worth to them. Government is in the best position to pursue those uh, the, the, those who are stealing that intellectual property, whether through criminal uh, acti uh, enforcement, law enforcement activities, or in the case of some nation states who are particularly aggressive uh, through, through uh, our bilateral conversations. Well, let me, uh, that's a good phrase, bilateral conversations. Uh, there are some people uh, currently in the government and who've left who would like the bilateral conversations to involve a really big stick and smack people around, create a deterrence framework. What I'd like to do is uh, offer the idea of, uh, out to the audience, maybe for our questions, about whether uh, the government needs to take a more active role in punishing the people that are stealing this information, A, and B, uh, I'd like to explore the idea of how do we quantify the value of that intellectual property. I've heard people that I respect say that we may not know for 20 or 25 years at which point it's going to become a very real national security problem because it could um, uh, shake our economy because so much is being taken. Um, I wonder if we should open it up to questions now or uh, why don't we open it up to questions and wait for the microphone, please. So sure, just uh, go ahead and just get the microphone to this guy here, please. <coughs> That's fine, sure, we'll start there. Thank you. Great panel. I'm uh, Mark Anderson with Invent IP. We've spent, I think, five years now looking at the question you just raised. And I'll give you one example as an answer to your question about the value. I don't think anyone's properly valuing Crown Jewel IP now. It gets carried on corporate books for replacement cost, insurance cost, uh, no cost at all, right off. And none of those are true. We've invented a new term which is really useful, I think, and that is international strategic competitive value. What is it worth to another nation to steal jet engine plans which will allow them to enter the business of aerospace compared to what you think it's worth to make a new jet engine? Do you have a question? Because we're, we're going to try to get through so, several people. Oh, I'm sorry. There. Actually, I thought you were asking a question about oh, how to value pardon IP. Me. Yeah, pose a question to our panel, Okay. Please. Uh, I don't think that we currently have a way of valuing Crown Jewel IP which is useful. It's, the numbers are all too small, even the 300 billion number that the IP Commission used. Do you have a thought about how we could actually, in an international competitive theft-based story, provide the proper values to corporate CEOs so they would actually know how to make that risk calculation? Anybody? So uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the framework which you've suggested uh, strikes me as more of a national interest uh, calculus and framework than it does an individual entity uh, assessment. Um, I, I, you know, the, the value to the thief um, really doesn't, doesn't tell me uh, the return on investment 
you know, what, what, what decisions I should make about allocation of resources to protect that information. Because um, to me, it's my, as, a, as a business, it's my bottom line. Um, certainly with respect to a national calculus, it's, it, it ought to be part of the consideration. Other questions here? Uh, yes. The panel's opinion on uh, exploits and whether there's a, a, a growing concern about the, the purchase of exploits on the internet, um, potentially by terror groups. Uh, the marketing, uh, the development and marketing of attack exploits. What do you think, Amos? I don't have enough experience in the, in the exploits, but uh, I think that the technological uh, guys. Kevin, are, you probably do. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, any exploit is portable. No matter who makes it, they can email it to somebody who has no idea what it does, and they just get a command line, do this against this machine and see what happens. So the threat that it's portable has always existed. What's emerging, what everybody's worried about right now is, yes, there's the, the biggest problem is theft of IP, but I think what's really concerning cybersecurity professionals right now is what are the nation states that really want to see harm done to our country? What are they going to do? Because this is such a portable way to do damage. Uh, it is a way where there's been very few risks or repercussions if you're in a safe harbor to launch these attacks. So it doesn't matter who makes the code. I'm making the assumption bad guys who, wanna, who are ideologically different than the five eyes or our country are going to use these exploits against us. It's a matter of time. And, and Bob, I just I want to, uh, uh, because it goes back to the question you asked me earlier about what's the greatest threat. Uh, and I started with IP as the most pervasive. There's no question that one of the ones we worry most about is the potential for attacks on our industrial uh, control systems. Uh, and that is one of the areas where that public-private partnership is so important. Very quickly, but it's Suzanne, also, just, uh, I want to stay yeah. with that. Yeah. Uh, people say over and over again, well, it hasn't happened, therefore it's not going to happen. Can you address that? Well, our adversaries are getting more sophisticated all the time. Uh, and, uh, and so it really is only a question of time, I think, before uh, certainly the, the, there's a demonstrated capability, and in fact, I think we've seen some of that already. We certainly saw in Saudi Aramco a very physical consequence uh, where 30,000 computers were turned into bricks. We have uh, time for two more questions here. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, Lynn um, Matice. <clears throat> if you've ever read any 10Ks, it's certainly a cure for insomnia. But one of the things that you find when it comes to the valuation of intellectual property, particularly intellectual property that's been lost and reported as the SEC now requires it to be, uh, is that you couldn't get hide nor tail out of what the valuation of it is to that company. Yet when you get into involved in real detailed investigations with them, they can tell you exactly what the value of that is. So what we have is the people who are investing in those companies not getting the value back of the information that they need to make those investment decisions, when are we going to get to a point where we really start forcing the true identity of what these losses are so that the calculations can be there so we can truly get an understanding from a national level of what the impact is? You know, you've all seen the 2009 report from Melissa Hathaway where there's a valuation of a trillion dollars worth of intellectual property stolen in 2008 alone just in cyber hacking. If you really look at the valuation of intellectual property, that's probably extremely low. So how do we attract this and how do we start getting the forcing movement of getting some of this information into the system so we can make true valuations? You know, this is, I don't, we can't devolve into an accounting conversation, but what I would urge people to think about is look at all the various economic harms that an institution can suffer because of an intrusion. <coughs> There can be loss of intellectual property. There can, there can and has been loss of business plans. So that when you're negotiating with someone, the other guy has your plans and knows where your positions are. If you lose personal identifiable information, you're going to wind up spending a lot of money uh, getting people credit repair. And I heard a story about a company that makes socks that wound up having its PII stolen. And basically, they had to spend a huge amount of money, and this is not a high margin business, to, to remedy that. And then, of course, anytime you have a tool on your network, uh, there's no guarantee the tool is only going to steal information. It can, it can do reconnaissance. It can become destructive. So I mean, there's an accounting issue for the SEC, but no one should kid themselves into thinking that because it's hard to value, that it has no value. I think we're going to have to wind it up there. Uh, thank you so much for listening, and uh, thank you all. It's fascinating stuff.